Most people who go into the forest enjoy trees and only few see the mosses. But in fact, we have about 120,000 different species and about 1,600 in Europe of mosses alone. Because they are tiny plants, you have to look very careful to see the difference. And if you look close enough, you will notice that the moss plants are a very little forest. And this is one of their functions in nature as well. They are tiny forests for even tinier animals like insects or bacteria living in them. So they are part of today's ecosystem. And the soil where the trees are rooting in is over the million of years accumulated debris of plants. But if you go back in time for 500 million years, all this would disappear. No trees, no soil, only bare rock. So the first plants developed from green algae, from fresh water, and they had to cope with very harsh environments. They had to develop novel innovations, a lot of genes which encode for protective agents, which could protect these first plants, these mosses, from harsh stress like cold, ice, heat, UVB light. And with this capacity, they really could transform Earth to the way we know it. So they gave the oxygen into the air, which allowed animals to develop on land, and ultimately we as humans, but they persisted. Since about 400 million years, we know mosses on Earth, and they did not change much in shape and nature. They saw the dinosaurs coming and going, and they saw us humans coming. And if we are not careful enough with our planet, they will see us going, but the mosses will persist, probably. One of the fascinating characteristics of mosses is that they are very adaptive to different environments, and they can withstand drought, like resurrection plants. And if you add a bit of water, then they bloom up again, they live up again. They are pioneer plants in the city as well, and they get their nutrients from the air, and therefore they are able to filter air as well. So they can take pollutants from the air and use them for their own bioenergy. So one major step for biotechnologists is to take a specific moss from this environment, very tiny fraction, bring it into the lab, and establish a so-called lab culture. So without any contaminating other species, no bacteria, no fungi, to analyze and utilize this specific moss. And so you don't have to disturb anymore the environment. You only take up a very tiny fraction and then you make a propagation in the lab of the pure moss species. Each moss has its peculiar needs for temperature, for nutrition, for pH. And so this is a very difficult task to transfer a specific moss type, moss species from nature. So it looks easy, but it takes a lot of efforts. Personally, I started very early, so I spent all my scientific life working on mosses. The moss Fiscometria patens was the moss I started with, and which is now considered to be a flagship model organism. So we sequenced in an international effort the whole genome, and in fact it was the third plant genome ever sequenced to total. And what we discovered is, for example, that this specific moss has about 12,000 more protein coding genes than humans have. One of the questions, of course, when we discovered that Fusco mitrella and in fact other mosses as well have so many protein coding genes was 
what are they good for? Because mosses don't have roots, they don't have flowers, they don't produce seeds. And what we find analyzing these genes is that they produce much more ingredients, bioactive substances than, for example, flowering plants. One class of these special ingredients mosses have uh, are polyunsaturated fatty acids and they are important for example for the human diet but they are important for the moss to cope with extreme environments. So they make uh, membranes smooth and flexible. In winter for example you see that all the plants lose their leaves or they get brown but mosses still under ice are green and making photosynthesis and in fact some years ago colleagues of mine from Canada found living moss about 2000 years covered by ice by a glacier and they were able to retrieve this moss bring it to the lab and regrow it there so it was still alive after 2000 years buried under ice. We have the world's largest collections, for example, for peat mosses called sphagnum mosses. And sphagnum mosses are very important for nature or for our whole planet because peatlands store double the amount of carbon than all forests combined on Earth. So they are important carbon storages and they are very important for moisture. So they have specialized tissues, the mosses. We see, for example, Protonema in the youth stadium, which is growing, for example, here in the bioreactor, which resembles green algae in fresh water. And the moss plant on this Protonema has stems and leaves and making erect growth and coping with photosynthesis and with the sun. And each of these different stadium have different chemical design in it for the specific needs. And mosses are very resistant because they have more and specific ingredients which help them to communicate with the environment and to protect them from attack. So a lot of medicine humans use, uh, but even cosmetics humans use, depend on plant substances. And so far, still very few laboratories worldwide work on mosses. And we still knew only a very tiny fraction of the biodiversity of the different mosses. We have so many different moss species in so many different parts of the world. So there's a lot of space and room to discover, to explore even the biochemical diversity. So we are really only at the beginning.